I feel like every time a new movie or a new TV show or a new video game comes out, there's this weird rush to see what the critic scores are on it and to see, you know, oh, does it align with my personal beliefs? And if it doesn't, you know, did Disney pay them off to give a negative review or it just turns into this weird, almost like team sport thing where if a movie that I personally liked got bad reviews, then that's a personal attack on me. There's this common consensus of, well, critics don't really matter, so why do we pay attention to them? Why does film criticism matter? And some people just outright say that we don't even need film critics to exist anymore because we just don't, I guess. It's just funny for someone like me because I started out as a film studies major in university and I eventually transferred to a different major that could actually get me a job in the real world, but <laughs> there is a science to film criticism. There is a legitimate method. The people that make these reviews, for the most part, know what they're talking about. However, that doesn't stop certain people from treating film reviews like a team sport, and I just don't understand it. So here's what I wanted to talk about. Do we still need film critics? Why do film critics exist? And what is their purpose? Well, let's get right into it. Criticism is a dynamic force in cultural discussions, but there's this common misunderstanding that critics validate popular opinions. Their consensus is supposed to reflect what other people believe. I'm someone who's guilty of this. Look at my King Kong versus Godzilla retrospective. I, in that retrospective, take negative reviews and read them and say, look how badly this aged. But upon further you know, reflection, I think it's important to recognize that critics should do more than confirm what the masses think. Their role is to engage audiences intellectually through thoughtful analysis. Criticism involves exploring and interpreting different forms of expression. Critics act as intermediaries, providing insights beyond immediate popular reactions. That's why a lot of the time when I see a movie and then make a video on it, I'll say, my thoughts on and then the movie title because i don't think it's fair to immediately review something as soon as you see it it's it hasn't like grown on you yet you haven't had time to actually think about it you're just rushing to make a youtube video but the idea that critics should just confirm popular views ignores the rich variety of perspectives in any cultural sphere when criticism becomes just a tool for validation it just becomes an echo chamber reinforcing existing views without adding any depth this approach diminishes the critic's role in fostering a nuanced understanding of art literature film or other creative works a good critic should question, analyze, and spark thoughtful discussions rather than just going with what everyone says. Appeasing popular sentiment can just lead to a homogenized cultural discourse, stifling unconventional or controversial ideas. Critics should be brave enough to challenge norms and present diverse viewpoints. This not only enriches the cultural landscape, but also encourages deeper audience engagement with content. Moreover, the belief that critics only validate popular opinions overlooks the historical impact of criticism in shaping cultural movements. Influential critics have historically challenged societal norms, expanded boundaries, and introduced new paradigms. From literary critics questioning established conventions to film critics advocating for avant-garde cinema, these figures have influenced cultural evolution, and they have power. One example that I can think of is when Gamera Guardian of the Universe came out in, I want to say it was like 1995, and Roger Ebert was reviewing it with Gene Siskel. And Gene Siskel gave it a thumbs down while Roger Ebert gave it a thumbs up. And Siskel was just like blown away by this. He was like, it's just rubber monsters battling on a set while Ebert actually saw the, the potential that this medium had as an art form and that he understood that he was witnessing the very best of it at that time. I think that you want to like this picture more than you know in your heart of hearts that it really contains entertainment value. Uh, the, the, That's probably true. Okay. Now, this is a very kaiju-centric channel now on YouTube, but with me, I feel like there's this sort of consensus among my audience that a lot of critics just hate kaiju movies for being kaiju movies, but... I don't think that's necessarily true. This is a little side tangent here, but what I'm going to say is look at Minus One, look at Shin Godzilla, and then compare that to the MonsterVerse, where it's clear that more thought was put into character with Minus One when you compare it to the MonsterVerse. That doesn't mean that the MonsterVerse isn't entertaining. It's a lot of fun. I like those movies, but I think that what kaiju fans want out of these movies is very different 
than what a film critic would want out of these movies. And that's a very important distinction. Film critics are educated in how films are made. Now, I'm not saying that kaiju fans are uneducated, but what I am saying is they are looking for deeper things beyond just giant monsters, which you could then just say, well, then why are you watching this movie if you're looking for something deeper? But I still think the best kaiju movies have really good human stories. They have really good filmmaking behind them, and they represent the best of the genre for a reason. Getting back more to general film criticism, the need for nuanced analysis is crucial. If it was just a bunch of dude bros who saw a Marvel movie and went, yeah, you know, five stars, check it out. Like, we wouldn't have a healthy discussion. Film as a medium has many layers that deserve careful exploration. Critics should move beyond just validating popular hits and delve into the complexities of cinematic art. Focusing solely on mass opinions can result in neglecting independent and experimental cinema. Limiting criticism to commercial successes might overlook innovative works that challenge traditional storytelling and visuals. Again, looking back in time, there's The Thing from 1982, which bombed at the box office and was trashed critically, but is now regarded as one of the best horror movies of all time. And why is that? Well, a lot of film critics just jumped on the bandwagon of saying, yeah, this movie isn't good, don't watch it. And that's something that I don't like about film criticism, is how there very much seems to be this general opinion that everyone has to go with. And a lot of critics don't like to stray from that path. They like to just kind of go with whatever the consensus is, give their own sort of take on it, but still go with it and call it a day. I think personally that critics should champion diverse filmmaking styles and voices, encouraging audiences to explore a broader cinematic range. Furthermore, film criticism involves more than just a simple thumbs up or thumbs down, or giving a review score. It requires exploring a film's themes, visuals, and narrative choices in depth. On the other side, though, I do think that critics should consider the entertainment value of the project. If a movie is a lot of fun, I do think that critics should consider that. They should consider the purpose of it. They should consider why the filmmaker made it. If it was a movie like Evil Dead, for example, it deserves to have its laurels as a very fun, over-the-top horror movie with fantastic atmosphere and amazing jump scares and amazing practical effects. And thankfully, a lot of critics have been getting a little bit better at this, but still. A film critic should bridge the gap between filmmakers and audiences, providing a lens through which viewers can appreciate the artistry and the intent behind each film. This demands intellectual rigor and a deeper understanding and deeper engagement with films beyond their commercial success. So how do we fix this specific issue? Well, I think a reasonable place to start would be getting rid of scores on IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes and Letterboxd. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I rate stuff on Letterboxd too, but at the same time, it's one of those where on this channel, I've never said, yeah, this movie, it's a 7 out of 10. It's an 8 out of 10. Instead, I just talk about why I liked it or why I didn't like it, what I liked, what I didn't like, and go super in-depth on that rather than just settling everything down and condensing it down into one big score. Because when people nowadays just see, oh, it's a 7 out of 10, okay, they don't care about what's actually being said. They don't care about the actual critiques. I mean, look at Anthony Fantano, who is a music reviewer here on YouTube. If you just scroll you can see the audience interest and in how the peak is almost always the very end of the review when he just goes yeah i'm feeling a light to decent you know six on this project i think it's very interesting though that as cinema evolved so did film criticism the french new wave introduced the auteur theory influencing critics like andrew saris to identify recurring themes and styles across a director's body of work this shift elevates film criticism to an art form emphasizing a filmmaker's unique voice Critics like Roger Ebert made analysis accessible to a broader audience, bridging academic and popular understanding. And now in the digital age, we have, you know, more of the, the this is a seven out of 10 or four stars, you know, and this is because of blogs and social media. People only have a certain amount of time to read something. So if they just see a number value, they go, okay, I get it. I'll see this or I won't. And it's because of these blogs and social media posts and Rotten Tomatoes and all this stuff, while this diversity of perspectives is valuable, it risks oversaturation and less thoughtful analysis. Critics today have to navigate a landscape where their reviews coexist with user-generated content 
And this just emphasizes the need for better informed and discerning voices. There's a reason why I'm very selective with what I review on the channel. People have asked me to cover certain movies and it's like, well, a million other people have already talked about it. I would rather talk about Shea St. John because while that is somewhat popular to talk about, it's not like, you know, when Alien Romulus came out and a million people were covering it and I would have just gotten lost in all the hype. So, to finish this out, do we still need film critics? Yes, of course. Despite changes brought by digital platforms, critics remain essential for several reasons. Firstly, critics offer informed analysis that goes beyond immediate reactions seen on social media. They provide expertise on filmmaking techniques, themes, and cultural implications, which I think leads to a richer understanding of cinema. In the age of information overload, critics, good critics, act as curators, helping audiences navigate a vast amount of content. While I don't consider myself to be a film critic, I do curate movies for my audience, and I tell them, hey, this movie's really good, go and check it out. Or hey, this movie's really bad, don't watch it. Film critics' recommendations guide viewers to significant films and encourage exploration of new perspectives. And I think the age of the internet has really helped with bringing new voices to talk about movies that people normally wouldn't. A good example is Red Letter Media when they made their massive video on the Star Wars prequel trilogy. At that time, people were talking about Star Wars, but it wasn't exactly in the same sense that they were. It wasn't in video format in a very digestible manner. And you slowly move down that timeline, you get people like the Nostalgia Critic, who would go very in-depth and focus more on the comedy angle than actual film criticism, but the Nostalgia Critic is still really, really, really good at talking about things like animation. He knows how to get an opinion across to the audience, and it's in a way that is very digestible to mass appeal. Nowadays, we have people like Chris Stuckman, Jeremy Johns, and CinemaSins, which, ew. It's just such an interesting and diverse landscape that when you look at film criticism on YouTube, I think it's a very interesting part of history right now. When you look at film criticism on YouTube, I think we're just in a very interesting part of film history. I think it's it's weird living in this time. It's almost like the Wild West, where any Joe Schmo can set up a camera and just start yapping, which that's what I do, you know? <laughs> but at the same time, I think that we're putting too much power in the hands of critics, and a lot of people just listen to them too much, or they're too focused on review scores. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the Rotten Tomato score is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the letterbox score is or what IMDb says. Watch a movie for yourself. Listen to your own opinions. Get educated on what film is and what filmmaking is as a medium. And decide for yourself. If someone that you respect doesn't like the same movie as you, that's okay. I just don't like how film as an art form is becoming something like team sports. Which, I like sports. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's a brewer thing right here. I love baseball. I love football. But film... It's not the place for that. And the same goes for box office numbers. I already made a video on that, go check that out. And the same goes for box office numbers, how people compare box office with one movie to another, and it's just, it's also tiresome. But go check out my video on the box office if you're interested. And with all that out of the way, I'm Cole McCormick, you're watching Firewind Media, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.